Kia kato katoa. Welcome everyone to the first AES New Zealand seminar of 2024, Artificial Intelligence in Evaluation by Dr. David Fetterman. This seminar is recorded and it will be uploaded into the AES YouTube channel. I am Marini Sanka, the co-convener of AES Aotearoa New Zealand. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the diverse lands in which we all come from. I'm speaking from Pornake, Wellington, Aotearoa, and I acknowledge the leaders past, present, and emerging from all our lands. Just to note to please keep your mics on mute and type in your questions into the chat. We will have about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, and I apologize in advance for any Wi-Fi interruptions that might happen during the session. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Fetterman, founder of Fetterman and Associates, renowned for developing the empowerment evaluation approach. David has worked in diverse contexts and countries, including Japan, Brazil, Ethiopia, and Aotearoa. A former president of the American Evaluation Association, David has earned several prestigious awards, and he was named the top anthropologist of the decade of 2020, which was celebrated in Times Square. I'm so excited to delve into AI. So over to you, David. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody. Nice to see uh, folks I haven't seen in a while. A lot of friends, a lot of colleagues uh, in New Zealand and in Australia, of course. Uh, so thanks so much for having me today. I'm going to go relatively quickly because we have a short period of time. And uh, I will already let you know about an hour or two ago, I was on the net to make sure I'm up to date because it changes that quickly. Uh, I'll be wrong in a number of things in about three hours, so hang in there. Uh, things are definitely changing rapidly, but the core should be pretty solid as far as what you hear today. And when I all of the pictures you see are um, AI generated using Dolly 3, just so you know, uh, they're not just random shots. And take your time and you'll see I put the text, the prompt I used to get the picture underneath most of the pictures. So you can get just a feel for how precise you have to be in your language when you're prompting things to get what you want. Um, think of it like a Google search. It's not quite right the first time, second time. Same thing with all of AI at this point. It's getting better and better and better, but I, I you know, want to warn you, some of it takes a little tweaking to say the least. We're still, it's like a baby. We're just, you know, helping to nurture it and develop it, giving it feedback, and it's changing very, very rapidly, as you'll see. Let me keep on going forward. Uh, this is just the text I put in to get that uh, um, picture, which is not entirely what I wanted, but close enough in terms of artificial intelligence um, on one side holding the scales of justice, because there's truth, fair, fairness, equity that we'll talk about. And then there's the whole concept of, and then, and, and, you know, an evaluation also being sort of, uh, looking at for accountability and that sort of thing. And then you have the other side, this young girl pulling the fish and that sort of thing, and maybe helping someone learn how to fish, which is more the collaborative participatory empowerment kind of thing, uh, all in one slide, just playing around with it. Well, this, the reason sort of that I'm doing all this today, uh, at least in part, is because we introduced this um, session uh, at the American Evaluation Association meetings in October, 2023. And you can see what kind of response we got. We had no idea it was gonna be this uh, well represented. It packed the room, people on the floor, out in the hallways are coming through, they're crowding in, and that wasn't even everybody. It was amazing. So based on that, we thought, well, we better keep on uh, learning and sharing. And that's all what, none of us know everything and certainly not, I don't either. It's a matter of us all learning together, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, as a consequence of this session that was so popular, so you know, well attended, we created a uh, LinkedIn uh, page, AI. Feel free to join and join in. And if you are uh, got some interesting insights, put it on there. We're all, as I say, seriously learning this together. We also, as a special edition of um, New Directions that came out, Evaluation Artificial Intelligence, wonderful resource as well. You can see this just blew up. I mean, you know, from even our, our work just in October, it's gotten to be this amazing proliferation of uh, uh, activities and discussions and dialogues. And we'll go over as much as we can today in a short period of time. 
So let me give you just a very brief history, a uh, feel for this, for those very uh, new to this area. In the 50s and say 56 period, that's really the birth of AI. It was at a Dartmouth kind of workshop. And if you're familiar with Alan Turing, there's a lot of movies about him. He really did the undetected imitation test where you ask a computer something and they respond and you can't tell the difference that it's actually a computer. In the 56 to 90 period, that was what we call the AI winters. It really was, I know, surprising, but declining funding, very little interest. The only thing that was of major kind of interest and got people's attention was you, they developed a chess playing computer system that defeated human champions. To give you a metaphor for the differences, in the 50 to 56 period, they actually came up with a checkers um, playing computer that was very attractive uh, and attention. And the sophistication is a whole different level when you get to the 56 and the 90s where you, it was literally a chess playing computer, but it gives you an idea as a metaphor of how much it had advanced in terms of analysis. 2010 to the present represents the age of AI, um, really in terms of facial recognition, self-driving cars, that sort of thing. That's in a nutshell, I'm going broad strokes, of course. So you have a feel for the pretty rapid development, but believe it or not, it's not a straight linear line. It was really of no interest to say the least for a while. And then boom. Once again, the text on the side, not critical, but just to show you what I use to come up with some of this, a picture of the main figures in the development of artificial intelligence. The reason I highlight this is not just to remind you of the different kinds of prompts you use, but when I put that in before, one of the pictures had mostly all men. So you have to watch for the bias, which we'll get to as well, that's built into the internet that feeds AI. But you can get around it by putting a check on it, which we'll, we'll talk about. So I'm gonna just give you a very brief introduction to the AI alphabet soup, I call it. Don't worry about this, but it's just so you have a feel for the language, the terms that are used. It'll give you a better feel for when we get into the, the core in a minute. Artificial intelligence. It's, in computer science, it really it creates machines to perform tasks requiring human intelligence. There's two basic approaches, which is the narrow AI, plays chess, driving cars, that sort of thing, generative, which is more reasoning, learning, and creativity. And I put those in pictures on the left, as you can see. You draw a computer playing chess and self-driving car on the top on the left. On the bottom, a picture of Einstein formulas, light bulbs, an old red schoolhouse, and a question mark. You see how concrete you have to be in some of the prompting to get what you want. And you'll see if you just put in something, you know, general, like give me uh, reasoning and learning, you're not going to get anything meaningful. It's not able to do that into the pictures as well as we'd like at this point. That's why I'm trying to show you how concrete you have to be. Let's continue with the alphabet soup because there's a lot of little terms. Don't worry about these, please. But I just want you to get a feel for it. When you hear the language, it helps you speak in the logic of this. That's all. Neural networks. That's the core of what we're talking about when we're thinking about our AI. They're like biological neurons. They're layers of interconnected nodes, final outputs, classification, prediction, generation, that sort of thing. The bottom line of the neural networks is you can have this supervised learning, which is input, output. In other words, if I put in two wheels and I see it's blue and it's got handles, I already have to put in what that's going to be in my list, which will be a byte. So it's input. This description will leap unsupervised learning, and that's what we're really interested in today, is it learns and it discovers. It just learns to discover how to find it. You put in that description, it finds it out there as what is the most common kind of conception that fits what you're describing. And that's, don't worry, I'll go into more detail of that in a minute. Reinforce, reinforced learning is critical to all of us as evaluators. That's feedback and it learns to optimize. So in other words, you're letting it know it's working or you're letting it's not working or that it's biased, et cetera, and it feeds it back into the system. And you'll see how incredibly important that is for all of us as we're playing around with AI. Once again, I put a picture of neural networks there just to give you an idea of what it might look like when you have to start using that, which we'll talk about shortly when we get to um, Dolly uh, 3, uh, different software. Let me just do a tiny bit more on the soup and we'll be finished. Artificial intelligence is really about large language models that we call it LLMs. It's a type of neural network trained on a massive text, like the internet, tons of books, you name it. Generative kind of natural language inquiries is what it's able to do. 
It can learn language skills in self-supervised manner. And that contrasts with the traditional language models that you rely on rules and annotations, that sort of thing. Last one, you're gonna hear APIs a lot. That means application program interface. It's just a way to connect to, when you use GPT, for example, or HTTP, when you wanna to connect to this massive data set, you can't just do it. You have to have some interface. That's, that's all it is. So this is not a big deal. I'm just gonna give you some language to play around with so you're not like thrown off when you do more digging than, you know, into this than, than today's session. So how the heck does this thing work, right? Artificial intelligence. It combines massive amounts of data with sophisticated algorithms to learn and perform tasks in a way that mimics human intelligence. And watch this. This is going to sound very familiar with what we do as evaluators. Data collection and preparation. This is an algorithm. So we have tools to analyze things, right? And to sort them. Selection and training. Training means you have a massive data set that you're going to be playing with to figure out, you know, how what the right response is, which you'll see in a minute uh, as we go through this. You do evaluation of how well that worked, and you refine it. And then you have the application and usage. That's all this process is. Once again, you can see I use draw a picture of a machine guessing at the next most likely word in the sentence, just to show you what this might look as a visual and what it takes to get that visual. As you play around with this, you'll see you have to play around with a fair amount to get what you're looking for when you get to the visuals. This is the heart of really what we have to say today uh, about the logic of how AI works. It's all simple probabilities. I know this is amazingly complex and sophisticated, but on one level, on another level, it's not. All it is, is math and probabilities. That's all this is. It's calculating based on all the text that you put in there and all the references and everything else. What's the most likely letter to come next after, after that first letter? And the second letter after that, and the third. And the same thing for words. Watch this. You put in United States of what? Not pizza. Of America. It knows the most likely term that's going to come after that phrase. That's really what this large language model stuff is all about. I know. This really, this, that's how simple this whole thing is on a certain level when you think about what is AI. So don't worry about all the alphabet soup. Don't worry about all the complications. It's really based on probabilities. That should shape all of our thinking about the power and how useful this is and how also misleading it can be at the same time. I said, draw a painting of a machine running after the word America in this one to get that image. Applications. Let's get to the heart of today. That was just good background, I think, so I'll give you a feel for really the thinking behind what AI is about. You can write letters, blogs, social media posts, reports, summarize articles, tons of our Google will give you like a list of articles to then go and read and find. This finds them, summarizes it, and presents it. It's a whole big game changer, as you already know. Draw pictures like the one now. All the pictures, once again, that I have here are from AI systems, Dolly 3 in particular. You can outline class lessons when you're teaching. And we'll talk a little tiny bit about teaching. We don't have a lot of time, but a little bit about why this is uh, a problem for some, but not shouldn't be for others as we learn to really change how we teach. Uh, it can write code because most of it's code, right? So it does that very well. It can analyze documents and pictures. And I want to highlight, this has been amazing. I do a lot of work in health and in medicine, as you probably already know. I want to show you something very cool on diagnostic activity, including medical uh, uh, x-rays. Watch this. Oh. This is, of course, uh, artificial intelligence, as you can see, looking at X-ray. Watch this. This is a trip. This is going to be, this is amazing. As you can see over here, uh, AI has access to, in this case, on what I'm showing you today, over 100,000 images of retinas. That's the one in the middle. That's actually mine. It enables ophthalmologists to make more precise diagnosis of diabetes, blood pressure, kidney disease, Parkinson's, liver and gallbladder disease, heart calcium score, which is used to test if you or you know may have a heart attack uh, or if it's likely, and Alzheimer's. AI is access to colonoscopy images, that's in the far right, uh, to identify polyps better than gastroenterologists. And then on the left, AI access to x-rays, diagnostic accuracy surpasses, surpasses seasoned radiologists. They don't get tired at the end of the day like a radiologist does 
uh, or uh, 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 gastroenterologist gets by the end of the day. It's consistent and has a massive data source. It's incredible. If you want to see more about this, look at the TED talk by um, um, Eric Topol. Can AI catch what doctors miss? Do you have more detail? But already the precision, this has only been around for what, a year? And for most of us, really since November, but I think OpenAI opened up in about 2022, if I recall. Um, in any case, look at that, those TED Talks, if you want to see more detail than I can give today. At the And this is, can you imagine what it can do when it starts to see a million images instead of only 100,000, which is, of course, could be done probably in six months, not in a year. This will all be, it's amazing how fast, as we all know, this is changing. Anyway, let me keep on going. Problems. There are problems, as we all know. Hallucinations. We've heard a lot about hallucinations. Hallucinations are not lies. It's a misunderstanding. It's stretching knowledge, and it's not malicious. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about in a second when we talk about the moon. Confidentiality. There are issues of proprietary information that is a learning system that it can then take and someone else picks up. However, you can now already get around that by having personal language models on your own hardware. We'll talk about that in a minute. Attribution, it's the Wild West. How do you respond to whether it's a real reference or not? Well, already they know our concerns and complaints and it's been feeding back into it. And the first stage is to insert your own references and prompts and ask for references. But it can do more than that already. And that's why I'm glad I checked about two hours ago to see if that's even updated, which it has. I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, sources of data, ask for sources, triangulate, bias, there's absolutely bias in gender, race, socioeconomics, and they're significant. You ask for correction, you ask for feedback. It's now doing it for itself already in response to our concerns about these issues. Not perfectly, but already in that in motion, as I'll show you in a couple more slides. Employment, people are worried, oh, I'm going to lose my job. Well, if you're doing something repetitive uh, and at a lower level, uh, and you're doing simplistic kind of programming, for example, yeah, you will, there's no question, which may allow you to operate at a higher level than you're operating now if that's if you're in that situation. But it is a, it's like, you know, when they had the rotary telephone folks, uh, they were displaced, there's no question, had to learn new skills when we had, when we transformed uh, the whole system of communication. Equity, this is a really big one. Um, the AI gap is a big deal. Um, and if you haven't seen the term, the moat, uh, I'll show you what that is in another picture. But it's really um, when one agency like Apple or like um, Amazon or anybody has a competitive advantage over other companies, um, they can protect themselves and entrench themselves. And then they have a priority that transcends what you know we, we could ever compete with. The dem democratization of the net is really about, or about AI, sorry, is really about um, making AI available to all of us. It's so that no one has that massive competitive advantage uh, for us as well. Let me show you what that looks like in a sec. As I say, I, I'd mentioned the hallucinations first. Here's an example, just to so understand what hallucinations really mean versus the hype about, oh, it's lying to us and all this other stuff. When you ask AI to show us all parts of the moon, all sides, it shows you a picture that's not true. It's partly correct and part of it is made up. It's not lying. We don't have a picture of every side of the moon. So what it does is it's trying to respond to what you're asking for and it fills in the gaps by inter interpolating the differences and the links between the ones it does have. It tells us what we want to hear. I'm not saying that's all wonderful and perfect uh, by a long shot in terms of what we need for accuracy, but it's important to understand that rather than just thinking it's lying and trying to you know fool us and whatever. That's what this hallucination is really all about. Briefly, I just want to touch on these if I could. With equity, it's a big deal. We want to look at issues of race, gender, religion, because what's in the net, for example, as our data source, if that's what we're relying on, and we're changing rapidly to our own enterprise sites that are protected from going on to the net and you can control the quality of the data. Right now we're talking about uncontrolled quality of data on the net. And of course it's gonna be racist, it's gonna have gender issues, it's gonna have religious bias, of course. It's reflecting what's in there. 
So that's what we have to talk about when we talk about what's the algorithm, what's the database it's being trained on, et cetera, which now can be controlled to be of higher quality than what we're using at the moment. The moat, as I just mentioned before, is really the difference between, in this case, when you're talking about democratization, the big AI you know, companies that are controlling that at the moment or have um, um, sort of the, what you would call the sway or the power associated with it and the technology is now the moat is getting smaller and smaller in terms of what other companies can do, what we can do, et cetera. I think it was um, Google was the first one that had a leaked memo about we don't have a moat and that's what all companies want to have. And luckily they don't because it allows us to have a greater chance at democratization of this, that we don't have that gap with that big moat. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a professor, but I'm still a student. I go, I've been to a number of courses on AI as well. And one of them was done by the um, Knight Foundation. I did an evaluation of them many years ago. They're for journalists uh, and they invited me to their sessions. Um, and one of the things I posted in my uh, assignments was that we have to look at piercing the AI veil. And that's, I drew that, or they drew it by some of my words over here. Um, what's behind the algorithm? What's behind the data it's being trained on? It's exposing, explaining the logic of AI's role in government, business, and academe. It's the same as reporting conflict of interest, bias, et cetera. You know, where's the money coming from? I've read a number of studies, which I can share with you. We can look on the net uh, for rigor is important because you can get false positives. There's a famous case with the shop, uh, uh, shot spotter example, person landed in, in jail for a year with false data about that was AI generated. Facial recognition software creates distortions very often with ethnic minorities. If you ever try it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Is it improving literally day by day? Uh, yes, obviously. But only because we're feeding back information that isn't quite right, we're asking enough questions, that's realizing it's not producing the right thing, et cetera. Anyway, uh, the point is our job in part is to use this to enhance our work, to make it easier, but it's also to look at behind the veil, what's going on when we need to. Let me mention some interim solutions and they are changing, so bear with me, literally as we speak, but some of them are things like this. For proprietary information, where you don't want your private information going on the net for others to you know, learn from or steal or whatever, they have personalized language models already. For only $100 to $200, you can train personalized language models on your iPhone and home computer already. So you can control whether it has access, uh, whether it's out there in the net for others to steal or use or whatever. Attribution and accuracy. You can add references or ask for references. I'm gonna show you an example of what's going on already that's already responded to this concern. It's amazing. And racial equity bias, same thing. You have to search for bias, report it, provide feedback. If you use vetted databases, which is what I'm talking about with these sort of either enterprise models or proprietary models, you can vet that data so it's quality data before it's used for analysis, et cetera. Look at this. This is like in real time, okay? This is like, like a day or two ago. Um, this is Copilot, which I'm using a lot now. And I just said, you know, something about describing APIs and that sort of thing. And guess what? I didn't even do anything like I normally do, which is please ask for references. I didn't do any of that. I just asked about APIs and helping to explain what that is, right? And look on the bottom. It put a hypertext link. If you want to learn more about how APIs work, and I clicked on that, and look at it. It shows you the references. If that's not enough, You've got the one, two, three, four, five footnotes you can go to as well. I didn't even ask it for, you know, the veracity of the information. It plunked it right in there. So there are self-correcting things that are happening as literally we're speaking uh, right now, uh, providing references automatically like this one in Copilot. I didn't ask it. Providing additional web references. I didn't ask it. It did it. Providing footnotes. It did it. The point is a lot of this is also minimizing costs. It's reducing entry barriers when you can first reduce it to you know free, which we'll get to in a second, and reducing hate speech also because it's constantly checking on itself in that regard. That's why this is really important because it's a learning model, but it depends on us asking the right questions and then asking it to check on itself, which it does. 
Sorry, I put so much time into that part. I want to go now into the chat boxes or making a transition here. So you have very concrete examples of what things can, can what you can play with. Once again, this is 100% correct as of uh, right this moment. And then of course I'll be wrong in about two or three hours. So hang in there, no, probably three or four weeks. I could be wrong, seriously, on uh, which is ones I would prioritize. BARD is uh, one uh, chat uh, uh, box that's really cool done by Google. And when I say soon by Gemini, it's already happening like literally right now. And, and that's what's being, Gemini Pro is actually what's powering it. So it's making it much more useful than it was. BARD I would put at the bottom of my list as far as uh, how well these perform. And I know I'll be 100% incorrect uh, in a year because it has access to everything Google does. It just doesn't work well yet, but it, it probably will surpass everyone. The most, uh, one of the most common ones is chat GPT 3.4. It's free. The problem is most of the data is limited to 2022. They're adding to it slowly and surely, but it's really, if you want to know something like what's the best you know teapot to buy uh, today, it won't be able to answer that question correctly. So it's nice. It's it's less. Let's see. I would say it's less accurate but faster than Chat GPT, which is the most popular one, of course, out there. But it costs twenty dollars a month. Is it worth it? Yeah, it's sort of. But if you ask me, no. And I'll tell you why in a second. But it's a very powerful. It's the best one out there. Uh, as far as accuracy in terms of what we're looking for. Um, and it's the learning rate is incredible for itself. Quad is another one that handles long text better than most other ones. So it depends on what you want to use this for. Having said all that, if you want my recommendation, and I have no vested interest in any of these whatsoever, it's definitely at the moment Microsoft Copilot AI. Why? Because it gives you chat GPT-4, and Dolly is a, is a way to create uh, image images. All the pictures you've seen, I use Dolly for that. Dolly 3, for free. So, I mean, you know, you use Edge to use it. So, from my thinking, it's, it's the one to go with at the moment, uh, if you want to play around with this after the session. And this is what it looks like over here. Just want to see the, the front page of it. It says stuff like, you know, why do people fly in their dreams? Um, what's a funny limerick thing you can do? Create a poem, write step-by-step -step instructions, make pizza, you know, you name it. Look at this though, this is most important. Choose a conversational style. Creative, balanced, more precise. You can do it. You see in the bottom, you just type in the bottom, your question. But you have to get more and more concrete about the questions. That's all this looks like for Copilot. <laughs> But look at this, this is a very interesting analysis I checked on. According to a recent news article, Microsoft Copilot does offer free access. So I checked it myself, GPT-4 and Dolly 3. Those are the most advanced ones we have. However, it appears that the app has not impacted the population entirely because people are still buying a $20 one, even though you can get it for free. It's very bizarre, but that's, you know, I wanted to just show you, honestly, that's the reality at the moment because I think people are just not familiar enough with the options. So they're going with the tried and true, tried and true, you know, over since what, a couple of months uh, for the one and paying the money. So anyway, it's just an interesting phenomenon. It's knowledge is not catching up with that pattern of behavior in terms of decision-making yet. Which is one of the reasons I'm trying to share what I'm learning with you as best I can, because there's distortions and misunderstandings and I don't know everything by a long shot, but I learned a lot uh, between courses and you know delving to myself, et cetera, that we need to share with each other. Anyway, back to uh, tools. So there's Dolly 2, which is not as conversational in terms of, that's the whole point of these things, chat, GBT and others. They're conversational rather than being a computer language to be able to get these answers. So I use Dolly 3 because I work in tobacco prevention in Arkansas, uh, Ms. Argo, uh, as uh, keeps uh, helps keep kids away from tobacco and adults, uh, uh, minority kids uh, for ages now. And I'm working with them to help them do empowerment evaluation work, uh, self-evaluate their own programs. So I wanted to show an image um, of how important and powerful this problem or how serious this problem is worldwide, because this problem uh, of smoking in particular, um, 
don't know if you're aware of this, but tobacco kills more people than you know suicides, uh, AIDS, car crashes, you name it, combined. But it's a worldwide, global problem, not just an American, United States problem. Uh, so I wanted an image that would be powerful in my evaluation reports. And I asked this, a hand holding a globe with a cigarette. And it works as a nice visualization using free Dolly 3. There are other tools than Dolly. I don't want to go into too much detail, but there's plenty out there. This one's called KREA, Kria. And look at the difference. This one I can create, um, draw a 60 year old professor with white hair and white beard, interesting, uh, writing his new book. And that's not exactly me, that's for sure, but it's more realistic in the portrait of a human being in this case. Um, and it's not too bad. One of the problems with a lot of visuals, as you'll see, they're not good with hands. This one's okay. Many of them show three fingers instead of four. So a lot of things that still have to be cleaned up and improved, but it gives you an idea of what these things can do. I'm just showing you another alternate one than Dolly 3, so you know there's many out there. Now, I want to emphasize that it does take work and that I don't get it right the first time, second time, and sometimes not the third time when I'm doing this. So you have to give it iterative prompts. It learns from your prompt after prompt after prompt. The first prompt I gave for this one, because I'm also doing a, uh, I'm doing evaluations um, using empowerment evaluation in India, and we're trying to eliminate tuberculosis. USAID is funding it. And um, one of the things I try to do, of course, is come up with visuals to go with our reports to show what our successes are, our failures, you know, our uh, areas for refinement. So I tried this one. The first prompt was a picture of a hypodermic needle eliminating tuberculosis. Well, that's not what I had in mind. See how the the uh, lungs are like in the hand and what doesn't leave much. And it's awful with, with words, see, it's spelling, tuberculosis. It, you put it in there, it will misspell it every time. So I try it again. I reword it to a hypodermic needle eliminating lung disease in rural India, because a lot of stuff is in, in rural parts of India. We're looking in four states right now. In any case, look at that. That's not really what I had. I had the rural approach. I could see the kids, but that's not going to be too effective for my report. Uh, the needles in the air, got lungs hanging out there. It's kind of bizarre looking. So I did it again. I did a hypodermic needle in a person's arm. It has to be very literal to eliminate lung disease in rural and, and that worked. That's close. That's what I'm having in mind. So you have to play with it and play with it till you get closer to what you want. I just want to give you a concrete example of a real life thing in my evaluation work that I have to do to get it to work correctly. But when it does, wow, it's pretty powerful and free. So prompts, not a big deal. You need clarity, clear instructions, line breaks sometimes. Uh, you want to specify the desired tone and or length. You can tell it five pages, two pages, one page if you're doing an essay about something or a blurb or something. Style, you want it to be a marketing style, an academic style. Reference, provide reference text, minimize fabrications, but already you can see it can be self-correcting. Split complex tasks. If you ask it this humongous complex thing, it's going to mess up. If you can break it into pieces, you're in better shape. Chain of thought, help model can reason its way to correct the answer. If you give it pieces, it can connect the dots as it were. Test, improve by measuring its performance, like we do, we're evaluators, and record the changes. I record even which prompt it gives, as you can see, and I've tried to share them with you, so that I can see where I don't have it quite right. I'm learning how to ask the question better and better and better by recording it and remembering what went with what. Let me give you some demonstrations here because I know we don't have a lot of time tonight, but this will give you a pretty solid idea of what you'll get when you play around with this. This is using Bard. The way to tell which ones I'm using, which or anyone's using when they're doing this, is their little cute little pieces here. You know, you see this little kind of top or uh, that's uh, multicolored Bard. So this is Google's. So all it is, is I type in, uh, I want a five bullet history of artificial intelligence. It gives it to me. Early dreamers, see? And then it has the birth of the field, the 50s and 60s, see? It has what I've talked about, Dartmouth Workshop in 56. I just entered the prompt down here. Very simple. You see, I'll do a bigger picture of the same thing so you can see a little bit better. See? Early dreamers, birth of the field, et cetera. You get the idea, Dartmouth Workshop. Very straightforward. Chat GPT, which many of you are probably already familiar with, you're already playing with. I just put in, you can, and you can see how it's 3.5 and 4. Uh, when, and I say, when teaching a class about artificial intelligence, let me make it a little bigger for you. 
when teaching a class about artificial intelligence and evaluation, it's important to cover key concepts, which we did. Introduction to artificial intelligence, we have data quality, we've got evaluation metrics, we've got ethical considerations I'm embedding throughout of it. So I'm trying to put a check on myself to make sure I'm covering all the right things when I'm sharing this with you. Demonstrations, this is quad. This handles long text better. And I asked this, you know, for five examples, how to use artificial intelligence to conduct program evaluations. It's got sentiment analysis, it's got text summarization, image recognition, uh, the works. It pretty much tells you what we're looking for, analysis of large qualitative and quantitative data sets, et cetera. Um, I mean, the thing about, I mean, some of the stuff, you're gonna be amazed in a second, I'll show you more stuff that can happen in seconds rather than days as I show you a little bit more of this. This one, I use Copilot, which I highlight at the moment is the best one. Once again, I know I'll be 100% wrong uh, in six months, uh, maybe in five days, you know, who knows? But at the moment, this is the smart one to use because you get to use ChatGPT and Dolly 3 um, for free. So, I mean, I don't know. To me, I'm not, I don't know what I'm missing here. Why am I going to pay 20 bucks a month? But whatever. Um, this one, you click on it, you have more creative answers and questions that are associated with it, more balanced and more precise. So I go for more precise for what we do for the most part. And look at this. It tells me right here, use ChatGPT 3.4 and, I mean, 3.5 and then 4. Microsoft Copilot, Bard, Claude. So I made sure I covered the ground to make sure I didn't make a mistake. And you can download it to Word, PDF, text, and you can build on each question. It remembers what you asked and can get more refined if it didn't give you what you really wanted. That's just, I did a blow up so you can see it better since we're doing Zoom and stuff. Once again, it's just, you know, different tools, uh, chat boxes that, I, uh, that we're using. An application to evaluation, look at this. Draw a logic model of tobacco prevention uh, program. Uh, and it's got research and planning, community outreach, education, policy. So this is, I do a lot, as you know, empowerment evaluation. This is the my new book. I don't know if you can see it right now. I'll show it to you later if you can't see it. This one is empowerment evaluation and social justice. When I'm showing folks how to do their own evaluation, this book is great, wonderful book, great. But I can also show them to you how to use AI to do a logic model themselves. I can look at it. I can have other folks look at it to make, triangulate to make sure it's still clean and it works for them. But look what they can do with this that quickly. And that's what we did just with this one on our tobacco prevention uh, programs, uh, which I'm sharing with them. So they can play around with this with themselves and build their own capacity. So not depending on us all the time, which I know scares some people, but it just means that we can operate at a higher level uh, and not just do you know management information system that, that should already be in place already. Applications to evaluation, same thing, theories of change. I asked it to do for a tobacco prevention program using Copilot, and boom, it gave me the stages of change uh, over here of trans theoretical model, a planned behavior uh, theoretical model. So they can get a theoretical model and see um, over here, for instance, the California Department of Public Health Tobacco Control focuses on uh, interventions um, like the second there you go. Uh, healthy stores for community stuff, and they give you a footnote so you can go and check it out. The examples of how to use it. Anyway, I'm going to keep on going because I want to cover a lot more, just another five to eight minutes, and then open it up. Um, applications, once again, to evaluation, and there's a million of them, but I'm trying to give you as many as I can quickly. This is interview questions. Provide a list of interview questions in an empowerment evaluation. Hey, of course. They should know how to do this. So they read a little bit, maybe do some workshop, whatever, but they then need to check on themselves by just simply asking at any time. What are your goals? What do you think the program, uh, how do you think the program is working? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? I said, very straightforward. It's like, wow, this thing is, I don't know if it's gonna need me anymore. You know, it's like very clear, keep it a safe and supportive environment, open-ended questions, listen actively. This be respectful of different perspectives. It's beautiful. You get the idea. Check this out. This is really cool also. Uh, I've been really having fun with this. I'm just using ChatGPT for this one, right? You can do data analysis, okay? You can put a data set in or borrow one. I'll show you how to get them as well if you want uh, to do interpretation of the data set. Cleaning, you know, if you have like duplicate sets of information, you don't want duplicates, get rid of that, you have to clean it. And analysis. And it gives you a bar chart like this. I'm looking at salary trends for uh, for folks on uh, that do AI stuff and all that sort of thing. Here's how you do it. Say if you don't have your own data set, 
Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E, has free data sets all over the place that I use for um, pollution and population control and a lot of things. And I said, all you do is I typed in this. You know, oh, I, I clicked on the data set that's available and I put it here, jobs in uh, different data set, you know, kind of uh, jo different jobs I'm looking at for, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, computer science and stuff. Uh, I said, I, so I uploaded that, you click it into here, chat to be, and I said, interpret this data. And when you have all the aspects understood, say, I'm ready for the next step. It said the data has been cleaned by removing duplicate roles. It tells you what it did, which ensures better accuracy, et cetera, et cetera, stuff we already know, but it's doing this in like seconds, right? And there are no remaining du duplicates in the cleaning database. Are there like I've been, right? This is a trip. And look at this, let's use the salary trends by job category, salary trends by experience level, salary distribution. You can see if you look carefully, uh, what a shock. Machine and learning AI, look at that. That one has a beautiful salary range over here. Who knows how long it will last, of course, but right now that's the top one for salary range. Uh, and others are gonna start to disappear. This would take me approximately two days to do normally. And most of us, I think, some of you might be faster than me day, a day or day and a half. It takes me about two days. This took a, a lot of time. This took about almost, I don't know, 40 seconds. Holy cow. I mean, this is like a trip. This is a game changer. Anyway, let me move. I know we don't have much time, so I'll go quick. You can use DoorDash, uh, DoorDash, Dropbox has something called Dash, which you can use just on your desktop instead of exposing all your stuff onto the internet when you're using AI. And you can say, I just wanted to look at your computer, my computer files, my just my email, just my this. And it will only look at those things and do summarizations of your information as you want. Uh, it's, I'm just trying to show you, you can use this on your desktop already, never mind paying $100, $200 to have it uh, tailored for you. AI detection, don't waste your time on this. People are worried, oh, students are gonna be cheating or it's, you know, how good these, you know, the detection is. Most universities, most of the training I get also on this and the different faculty roles I play are that there's too many false positives, too many bias, biases, et cetera. And the bottom line, if we're worried about this, and I'm happy to talk to you more in the future, or look at John Nash's work, we're teaching wrong if we're only asking it to do what it can produce quickly, like do a summary of you know this novel you're supposed to be reading, and the then we're not doing it right. We should be asking about their thinking, about how they are coming up with what they're thinking about. And if you ask them to search, say on the net for some topic, tell me where the biases are and make the, you know tell the student to, to look for the biases and tell me what they are. In other words, we have to reshape our learning process and our teaching if we're that worried about cheating and that sort of thing. It means we're doing the wrong thing, but I can go into that in more detail. It's not 100%. There are issues of making sure that students actually maybe write things in class, et cetera, to deal with it at the moment to make sure we're getting their actual information. But I don't want to go into too much detail now. I'm just saying this is a wonderful tool to teach and to learn from with the right guardrails. Let me give you some resources and I'll stop in a second, but this is really important. And of course, I can send a PDF if you're interested, uh, but here are some things I really recommend for YouTube resources. If you wanna know more about uh, Bing and chat, uh, there's a beautiful little guide to Bing chat AI with Do Dolly 3. In education, I would look at uh, John Nash's uh, uh, podcast and stuff, Big Think, the role of AI in education. Uh, if you wanna know more about where I spend a lot of my time in in medicine, uh, Hinton is the, considered the father or grandfather of AI. This is the person on the right. Large language models in medicine, uh, and they understand and have empathy. We'll talk about that another time, about how they're training physicians to have better or more empathy um, uh, in terms of responding using AI uh, tools. Um, and then the one you saw me highlight earlier about how good it is in detecting things, that's um, can AI, AI catch what doctors miss? Beautiful piece. Uh, check out these kinds of references if you're interested in more. There's plenty out there. These are things I've been using to learn uh, as much as I can in a relatively short period of time. There are free training resources. Uh, IBM has one on generative AI. Um, I've taken the one with the Knight Center, uh, how to use chat, GPT, and other generative AI tools. Use them. I'm taking another one that Claremont's offered me. I'm a professor over there. Find the free courses. 
you don't have to pay for most of these. They're free. Learn. There's a tremendous amount in a short period of time you can gain. These are some of the references I use today. You don't have to use these. Use whatever you want. Ask me about them later. Whatever you want to do. But I looked at six strategies for better results. I'm learning how to do prompts better. Um, how AI chatbook bots like ChatGPT or Bard work. A visual explainer. Uh, mastering Google Bard prompts. Very important. Uh, it goes on and on. You get the idea. Ready or not, AI is here. What if therapy bots become too good? Very interesting article. Uh, the ultimate guide to data democratization and toward conversational diagnostic AI. Enough. I gave you a lot in an amazingly short period of time, but I'm excited. As you can see, uh, I'm sure you're excited. This is an amazing uh, point in time. It's a turning point for evaluation and for, of course, all of the industries. If you want more information, you can email me. I have a TED Talk that you might find interesting about um, empowerment evaluation in this case and the evolution of it. Um, and then a brief, brief bio sketch, et cetera. Let me cancel out of this so I can get to some questions. If you've got some questions that I can answer as quickly as we can. Thanks for hanging in there oh. for that. Uh, Dave, David, we have a while. We don't worry. We don't need to rush. We we can um, also go over time. We have a good um, 13 minutes. There okay. are quite a few um, questions in the chat, um, starting from... Starting from Anne, what impact impact with um, quantum computing have on these technologies? Oh, uh, it's phenomenal. It's, it's What's amazing about this is it is able to take the internet, massive sources, all of Shakespeare's work, I mean, you name it, um, and the speed in which it can sort, analyze, uh, and identify uh, patterns is uh, astounding. What's nice about uh, the kind of computing power we have is that if we didn't have that, then the algorithm wouldn't mean much. Uh, you still have to have the power behind it. If that answers your question. Uh, it, it's Right now we're having a lot of synchronicity of the right things coming together to make this possible. Um, the, the timing is, is incredible. Um, oh yes, can you have the presentation? I see that, yes, I'll make a PDF. Uh, and Maria, I'll send it to you and you can, you can post it wherever uh, you can if that's okay. So, Folks can have copies of this. Absolutely. Yeah. And it has hypertext links in it, by the way. So you should be able to link on to the things. If not, just drag and, you know, do it, put it in uh, an AI chat, not necessarily a Google one to, to identify some of these things. Um, and, oh, sorry, did I? Um, you Melanie, Melanie had a question about. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, but Melanie's question is about summarizing large quantities of data, which um, things like chat GTP cannot do because of the word um, limit. What, what um, software would you recommend for you that? Can, it's in a CVS file or a text file. Uh, you can then upload it. It can't handle word, it has too much garbage in it. You know, things you can't see, but a lot of, you know, things that in the spaces and stuff like that and the, and the programming, but most of you can. Um, it depends on which one you want to use, but most of these you can uh, upload. Like try it with um, Copilot, for example. And you know the example I showed with Prattle, uh, if you have a data set that's in that format, you can just upload that whole thing. Uh, and if you have it on your own private, if you some of you may be way ahead of me and you're already doing your own personalized data sets. I'm playing around with that now, something called Huggy Face, where it helps you program these things to your own space, your own um, domain. And that's a case where um, you are protecting it at the same time, as well as being massive data sets. Look at Pragle, you'll see examples of it and play with that first and then do your own is what I would recommend because I had to do that one to really understand how to use it correctly. Very cool, thank you. Um, how do you get AI to make editorials? Oh, we have already answered that, that's okay. Um, this chat GTP co-pilot, evaluate the quality of the references it uses as part of its process. That's by yeah. Lori. It, it does, as of today, I don't know what to tell you um, next week, uh, who knows what's gonna change, but I triangulate anyway. In other words, I will look at the references uh, and then I will also um, ask it to please check on the references and let me know if they're all accurate. So I actually am not only checking myself, but I'm asking it to check because that's part of its learning that helps all of us uh, when it's knowing that, because it, if it knows we're asking that, 
then it goes, oh, I'm learning from that. I better do that automatically. And that example I showed you where Copilot gave me the references and the, um, what do you call it, the um, footnotes, it didn't do that before. Before you'd have to go check them out. It would just use some stuff out and be half garbage and you didn't know what it was. I mean, I had one where you can ask, you know, about, I asked about myself, of course, and it said something about teaching in UCLA. I had never, I, I don't, I've never taught at UCLA, right? So it's like, what the heck was that? A fake reference. I found out what it was. My my uncle is also named um, David Fetterman, and he, uh, no, uh, Her he's Harold Fetterman, sorry, Harold Fetterman. And he not only taught at MIT, he taught at UCLA. So I picked up his name and, co co you know, merged it with mine when I'm asking about it. That's only two months ago. And now I do the same thing and it knows the difference. That's how fast these things are changing. So if you ask me any of this stuff two or three months ago, the level of inaccuracy was like astoundingly bad. It was like frightening. And it's still bad, but it's like way better in only a few months uh, for things of that nature. I've been literally testing it to see what's what it can do. So I'm sorry to give that much detail, but that's the nature of the change is so phenomenal, but it's based on our feedback about, well, that doesn't sound right. Or uh, could you check on that for me? That doesn't sound correct. And it will check in addition to adding and say, I want references. The more you tweak it with your own prompts, I would say is the best thing to do now. Remember, this is a baby that we have to be teaching it is what we're doing. It's a learning machine. It's, it's, and, and it's, it's only going to develop if we give it feedback on that looks racist to me. I'm, I'm very blunt about it, you know, or I don't think there's a gender balance in that picture at all. Uh, can you give me something that's more multicultural? Uh, that and it's learning from that correction that that argument I'm having with it. It's it's really a conversation. Um, that's great. Um, there's oh, plenty of questions. How would how would you manage privacy, David? That's the um, way to do that is th two ways I would say at the moment. Um, well, three ways. Uh, one, you can get an enterprise account for ChatGPT and other things like that. What that means is. It's protected. Uh, you're paying mm -hmm. for it. It's not free then. And you, you can even create your own data set, vet it to make quality you know, data in there. And it's protected in that spot. It does not feed back into the net. One of our big concerns was exactly that. And there was a massive lawsuit back in, um, I think it was December. Uh, so that was, you know, ancient history. That's it. What, that's like a couple months ago. Um, wow. That there was a big lawsuit about the proprietary stuff. Someone put some stuff on there from their they're firm, and then they were like, oh my gosh, I see it on the net, people are taking it. Well, at that point, there was no enterprise account that you could have to protect it. The second way, so one, you pay money, and you have it protected, it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, the second way is with these personalized models. Please take a look at those if you're interested. Um, for a couple hundred dollars now, I mean, between one and $300, you can create your own like little space, as it were, a cloud uh, for your account that's protected, uh, on your personal laptop, phone, whatever, uh, is a second way to do it. And that's why I say Huggy Face and other tools like that that I don't have time to go into today are tools that we can use, our level, uh, to make these. Or you can pay someone to do it, and they're not expensive. So that's the second way. And there, there are more other ways I can go into detail, but those are the best ways at the moment to keep the proprietary information you have protected uh, in, in, a, in a key space. And that's what companies, uh, I know, um, Google, Waymo, other companies are doing exactly that kind of thing to make sure that they have protected space because they still want the power of the AI, but they don't want all their stuff out there in the world. You know, because otherwise, if you don't have it protected, you are sharing it with the world. It's learning from it, but it's also putting it out there. And then you have to worry about copyright issues, um, uh, attribution, um, a lot of things. So not perfect. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Interest you've used on a level of transparency that's required when evaluation and outsourcing. Uh, let's see. Uh, gain consent from the client to use AI. Oh, yeah. You should be asking. Um, sorry. Let me read that for everyone. You, you see the one on, oh, i real fast on these in a second. Um, fantastic presentation. Interested in your views on the level of transparency that's required when evaluations are outsourced. Yes, definitely. You want to be very open about all that. No question. I understand that some New Zealand firms are adopting data procedure policy, absolutely, which they have gained, you have to gain consent from their client to use, yes, uh, AI in the de delivery of their services 
which is uh, agreed and specified in the work of uh, order of the contract. Uh, I would say, you know, it depends. It's not that simple. Um, yes, I would get permission whenever you get permission, but there are different levels. If it's a very tiny little group situation, it's a nonprofit you're working with, and they're just starting to get off the ground, I would say you want verbal permission. You may need some written permission if you're going to publish or put it out there. Yes. I would say you want to be very transparent. No, why not? I mean, I don't, I believe in honesty and straightforward. Others are going to come and bite you, you know what I mean? And why not? You want to be honest with people. So I would say you be as open as you can. Um, I don't think you have to have, you know, a written contract for every single, I want to, uh, take this uh, um, small data set on nutrition and see what AI says about it. You know, you don't, you got to just use your judgment as to how, how, if you're getting to private information, confidential information, absolutely uh, sensitive information. Um, it depends on what level the, uh, and what the stakes are, et cetera. Air on the side of transparency, I guess, is a, in a nutshell, but you know, none of us can afford all the time in the world and all the consent in the world for absolutely every single question. So you just have to use your judgment as to what's what's really appropriate. And let's just use your normal training. That's I don't think there's anything extraordinary about it. But good question, because a lot of ethical issues are started associated with all this stuff. And I don't mean to, by the way, dismiss all the problems. There are lots of problems. I just don't think we can ignore them. It's here, the state's not going away. And the best thing we can do is to help improve it by being immersed in it and knowing how it really works instead of guessing. There's so many people who are just afraid of the you know baby with a bathwater you have to we have to jump in there and see what doesn't work and what does work and why and then have our own recommendations we have to be part of that process of correction i, I believe it's like you wouldn't abdicate your responsibility with a student or your kids or anything like that right this is a baby uh it's, it could be reckless it could be misused everything can be misused every technology so our job is to do what we can to better understand it so we know what we can give for input for guardrails and things of that nature and anyway, that's my bias I, I just want to make sure you know, I don't dismiss the problems. I'm very much aware and immersed in how to correct these things, but I wouldn't know unless I immerse myself in the process, I guess, in a nutshell. So, oh yeah, you got the confidentiality thing. There are a lot of things like the like the enterprise thing. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Um, um, we have a question by um, Paul Rye. How can we use AI to our advantage? Um, can you say that one, David? As experienced evaluators, uh, Parai, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask David the question directly if you want to. Hi. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, David. The presentation was awesome. But um, for me, as an experienced evaluator, I just wanted to understand, like, I can understand if we give this basic commands, it will produce results. But um, how do I use it, being an experienced uh, evaluator, to my advantage to then further optimize it and take it in the track where I'm thinking, but also in a more polished way. Oh yeah. I mean, otherwise you and can the risk it. that I should be aware of when I do that so that I don't get misled. Thank you. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you're just, are you asking sort of different ways in which you can use it to, so you're not misled by the results part? Yes. So like, um, instead of asking, uh, like you were showing some examples, that's a good start, but like, if I have already certain structures and ideas, how do I work collaboratively with AI to take it to the next level with also getting my inputs in ensuring oh. that it also follows my leads and then understanding oh. what could be the potential risk by just going with AI. Oh, th there's so many. It depends on what you want to do. But um, I have students right now and colleagues using it to summarize masses, mass, mass of data sets, or um, like the one I just showed you with Gregel, or see what the patterns are. Uh, that saves me two or three days instead of and they do it in almost almost a full minute. Sometimes it takes to do the exact same thing. I have to spend a day and a half to do. That's one example of, of data. Cleaning, which is a pain in the neck, who likes to do that? Uh, and it does it really well. Uh, interpreting it uh, and then actually doing the analysis for patterns and stuff like that, phenomenal. But my point in that example is not only is that useful for data analysis, which is a nice sophisticated tool for all of us uh, and saves us a lot of time, it allows us to ask larger questions because we don't have to spend forever just doing that part. In normal evaluation, we spend the entire time just doing that, getting paid, 
shoot that out, got the patterns, that's enough. Today, it's like teaching in general. That would have been enough for an assignment, right? Now, you can get that quick. Now I can ask much larger questions about different kinds of, in this case, um, computer scientists and how much money they're making and what the likelihood of the projection is of one being something my kid should go into or not go into because it's not gonna exist anymore. Uh, so I have my own practical value for it or my students. But I, can, I wouldn't even have time to think about those questions. It's the same as um, qualitative data software, in my opinion, you know, like uh, in vivo or, you know, all the other ones where in the old days, and many of you are too young to remember this, but people used to use uh, little cards, little uh, uh, index cards like that, and they lift them all out and then they have to go, oh, there's this one and this one and sort it by hand and you have a pattern and go, oh my gosh, well, that took you, you know, about a year. But, uh, uh, you know, and now you do data sets and you can do that like in about, you know, a minute and a half, two minutes. Think of that exponentially, it's the same thing. Now, instead of having to read every one of those articles, okay, it does it, summarizes it for you. And now you can ask the larger learning question because now you see the patterns that are in there that you would have taken forever to find. And the real question isn't the patterns, it's what are the implications for the patterns that you see in that data for a specific ethnic group that you think is being disadvantaged or uh, not treated correctly, or there's an economic wealth gap between that group and that group that you hadn't identified before. You wouldn't even think about asking that because it takes so much time just to do the data sort. That's what's so beautiful about this process. Do we have to put a check on it? We have to put out a check on our own work to see if we got it right for data analysis and sorts, if there are biases. This is no different, it's just a larger scale and faster. Other examples aside from your literature search to do that, you can also say things like, I'd like to see what would my student's dissertation or my own dissertation if you're a student look like in that there's nothing wrong with that you don't want to steal and you know from it you want to say it gives you a logical pattern to start with about what your report your evaluation report would look like uh for in my case tobacco prevention or trying to eliminate tuberculosis our big our project in, in, in india right now what would be a, the summary of information based on all the stuff we've collected for all of our empowerment evaluations for example that's a lot of work i mean to go through all the different ones of project and the exercises we've gone through but if I put them together in this, in a CBS file uh, um, or, or a, data, a text file, whatever, I upload it to that, tell me what the patterns are, or clean it first, tell me what the patterns are, and boom, I can now ask much larger questions like, wow, if that's the problem in the rural area that I'm working in, in India, for example, uh, I see the same kind of issues of credibility or of trust of putting this, you know, terrible thing into someone's body when they worry about vaccinations, for example, uh, as another area I, I work in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the central city areas, but with low income. I can see the pattern that emerged that I don't have time to play with. Oh, sorry, going so long, but there's so many examples of what you can use on a routine basis that make your life simpler. And it does a lot of the busy work. So you, have, you can open your mind to other things that are much bigger patterns. But anyway, sorry to go on so much, but think um, about all- That you is do. very helpful, sure. thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, David, we are, even though we are five minutes um, over the time limit, I'm happy to go on if you are David. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, um, Tim, you have asked a few practical questions. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask David directly? Is Tim around? Yes, hi, thank you so much. Um, appreciate the, the um, really interesting, um, exciting new field. Um, yeah, just um, following on a, another discussion, I think with Marie, um, how, how I, I just checked, how can you actually upload documents into Copilot or um, oh, sure. what other platforms did you use? Because yeah. I can't find that functionality. No problem. Let me just uh, share with you one more time, if I could, give me one second. I'll be right back there, and I'll show you. It's it's simpler than uh, than you might think. Uh, watch this, and I'm going to just go back a second here, uh, like so, and like so. Let me show what it looks like. It's none of it's that complicated. Uh, it just looks like it because we're we're not used to doing it that much yet. But you see what I did here. I took Craigle and just play around with that for those still new to this, you know, using data sets of this, this size, there's a ton of them for free that 
may be relevant to your work or related. And if it's not, get a chance for playing around with it. So the, on Kragle, it has all these free data sets. I want to know some stuff about computer programming, stuff like that, and computer scientists and what kind of money they're making, et cetera, et cetera. So I just clicked on uh, the Kragle data set I wanted, okay? And then I it, it then put it down over here as a, a CSV file over here. Can you see on the left-hand bottom? And then all I did is I, I made sure I would look, would look good. I wanted to look at it and make sure it wasn't garbage and stuff that I really wanted, their salaries and, you know, what uh, where they lived, you know, and, and the actual title for it. So I know what to make of it, the title and the category, stuff like that. So I, I did check it you know, with my, my own eyes, not just rely on uh, artificial intelligence. And then I went to over here, ChatGPT, and I just put upload over here. You can drag it on, or you can see see this, the, you know, the regular, what do you call it, attachment things, like, um, what do you call it, paperclip thing, whatever. And I, I clicked on it and see how I put jobs and data CSV file here. And then I just typed in the box, which is this box here. See this, the, the, the paperclip? I just clicked on that and attached my, um, my file right there, my C CSV file that I want to clean the, the jobs file on it. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, interpret this data. And when, that's how simple this is. I don't want to make it sound complicated. Uh, it, it's sometimes I make it so simple, you can't see it. You know what I mean? That's happened to me is too. Is that the paid version, David? Is it the paid version or is it the unpaid version? Oh, unpaid. There's all free. Unpaid, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, only dealing, I'm only dealing with free. Uh, now, having said that, you can pay if you want to, because you get ChatGPT for twenty dollars. I use it for free through Copilot. Okay. Could, so, could um, I don't have that function, and um, I've tried uploading, and it says, "Sorry, I can't do that." Could it be a regional thing, like if uh, I'm using an Australian um server, the functionality here is different, or why it would it be, be different for you? It shouldn't be. Are you using which one are you using there? ChatGPT four or what are you using? Uh the free chat GPT three point five, but also copilot. Neither have um oh. any way to upload documents. You weren't able to do with co see chat three three point five three point the earlier versions won't let you attach or do anything. The mm. it has to it has to be four. So what you want to do is if, if you had chat GPT four then it has the same thing you just saw right there. I use Copilot and I use ChatGPT4 through through Copilot and then I attached it because it's the same ChatGPT4. Yeah, it, it wouldn't let me. Maybe is it if you're logged in through your enterprise, there's limited functionality? I don't know. It's not, yeah. I tried and it said apologize and said you can't. And Oh, which here's what you do. Do it again. Do a computer screen snapshot of what you did. Do a description and just email me. And if I if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer. But if I know the answer, I can then give you once I have the actual picture of it, I can then be more specific. I'm guessing though, it sounds to me like somehow you're going through the path of GPT 3.5 instead of four. And it's not a matter of the money because you, you can pay the money and you should be able to do it with four, but you can also do it definitely for free. I use in what do you call it? So take do it again, take a computer screen snapshot. Describe what you're doing again, so I remember because I get I get like you know literally hundreds of emails a day. So let me know um, what you used and whether it's four, whether you use Copilot to get there, etc. Then I'll know probably where the problem is. Okay. Um, Lack wants to know if I'm interested in training AI to interpret inputs, outputs, and their relationship to outcomes from case notes of social human services sector. Any references of this being done, particularly if there's research institutions where this is a focus? Where they're doing the input output uh, for for for. Uh, are you asking about the? There's two kinds of questions for that. Tell me which one you mean. Is it the input output as it relates to the supervised learning, where you already know what possible answers are, or the unsupervised one, where you're putting in say the information about it, and you're asking the net to or the AI to come up with what the pattern is. Is it the first or the second? Lack, do you want to unmute yourself and answer David's question? Are you around? Lachlan? It's not if, around. If you're not here, email me. Uh, if you get this recording, I'm happy to, if I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't know the answer, I'll let you know. But if I know which one it is, I can then be more specific. Uh, just in a nutshell, the answer to your question, if you ever receive this or see this later, is that 
the the unsupervised one is the one where it's going to be the most generative AI. It's going to be the one that's really going to tell you something that's based on all of the information out there. The supervised one is very delimited. It would depend on knowing the answer, a possible answer that would then be matched with that description. So if you do have a choice, if that's the underlying question, do the generative AI that is learning and discovering and searching is going to be what you really want for a more powerful answer than one that's already programmed to have the input output. But if that's responsive to your question. Can right, you hear me? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah, so um, my, my interest is in being able to um, potentially uh, train AI so that it can interpret uh, case notes that um, government oh. might see in service delivery um, oh. so that it can understand uh, the, the inputs and outputs in service delivery and interpret outcomes. And so oh. I imagine that would be supervised initially and yes. then maybe unsupervised in the future. Yeah, well, you could, you don't have to wait. Um, it depends on what you're looking for an outcome, of course, or product yourself. But from what you just said, I would use the uh, unsupervised actually, but you would delimit it to the data sets. In other words, you would say, like I did, you take the file, you plunk it up there, and then you'd say, Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. then you want to basically, but do it in like kind of the order I did it, which is, um, uh, you know, cleaning the data. Yeah. Uh, interpreting it so you know what the heck it really means from its perspective, and then do the analysis for pat patterns and trends, because otherwise you're going to get some junk. Um, I, I'm just telling you all the mistakes I've made. So mm. I've learned myself. Uh, I forgot to do the obvious. We're all taught to clean, right? You know, you, you know, mining your stuff. I didn't the first once. I got all the junk, and I thought, I did and I could see it. it. Didn't make sense to me. I went, oh, geez, I forgot a step. Just do what we all are taught to do normally: clean it up first, get rid of that redundant junk and all the other stuff. And then ask it to interpret, so it knows how to tells you what it means. So I don't, you know, I don't even know what it means sometimes in these data sets. And then ask it to do the analysis for patterns. So if you do that order, that's why I emphasize in the slides. Then you're going to be fine. And I don't, you don't, have, I don't think you have to stick with the um, traditional um, supervised because then you have to know the answers of what this matches up to. And you don't know the, I don't know the answers to that kind of thing. For those, that's beautiful. Case notes on it. See what the patterns are. I don't have time to go into detail, but if you read the article on therapy, it's similar. What do you do when you can put all those notes in, for example, about therapy, ther uh, psychotherapists put in, and it can come up with a better analysis of what those case notes are than you as a clinician? It, it, whoa, am I out of a job? Yeah. Yep. That's what the question is in it. But it does that with, the, with, with even confidential information of that nature. But that, of course, put it in an enterprise or put it in a personalized data set, et cetera. So you're controlling where it could go. But mm -hmm. you can do all that. I would recommend from what you said, though, to use the unsupervised. I think you're going to find it much more useful because uh, you're, you're, you're tightening the frame of what it could interpret if you only use the supervised. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll email you about um, potential research um, areas where this is being pursued. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. That's fantastic. Beautiful idea. Um David, do you want to give a plug for your calls that's happening in a few days? Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm teaching uh, for the American Evaluation Association on um, February 7th and 15th, one of their e-study courses on exactly this. We're going to highlight some of, of course, the slides we discussed today. And in addition, for the second part of it, I'm going to have everyone who's in the session use one of these chat boxes. It could be co-pilot, it could be who knows, you know, whatever you want, chat GPT, and they're going to apply it. And then they're going to come back and we're going to all critique it and give ideas as to what to do next or how to use this for a different purpose. If you're doing visualizations, do you want to use Dolly 3 or do you want to use something else? Not quite that, like Korea. Or do you want to use, you know, this for doing a, a, um, a marketing piece about your evaluation work and your firm or whatever versus an analysis uh, or a logic model or something of that nature. We're gonna go into that kind of detail of real application that we don't really have time to, to do today for that course. So yeah, that, thank you for reminding me. So two things to remember, for those interested in what I highlighted already for empowerment stuff, use the book first. This is the latest book, Empowerment Evaluation for Social Justice. It's a beautiful piece. It got an award already. It's only, it was done in, in 2023. That never happens. All of us, we publish stuff, who reads it, right? And this thing, they must have loved it because it has an emphasis on our work in India, trying to eliminate tuberculosis. 
and also on food justice in the United States. Anyway, so that's pretty cool. But this will help your folks that you're working with doing collaborative participatory and empowerment evaluation. And then introduce them to how to use artificial intelligence with this to learn to do this themselves as much as possible, build their capacity. Thanks for mentioning that, Maria. Oh, almost forgot those two things. Those, those are important. <laughs> David, we can we can go on forever. Um, on behalf of all of us and the AES, I would like to give you a, a very. I'm, I'm actually going to clap. I found this one of the like the most illuminating seminar. So um, it was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sure you'll get lots of follow up emails from people. And thank you everyone for for joining us for this almost an hour and a half. Not quite. Um, wow. Have I? If I missed you out, uh, we do have. I don't know how long David is willing to wait for. Just put your hand up and you can say some final words if, if, you, if you really want to do so. Yeah, and put something in the chat if you want very briefly. Uh, wonderful having all of you. Thanks for hanging in there. I know it's a little bit long, but I want to share what I'm learning. We're all learning this together uh, and it's evolving so fast. I thought it's important as a community, we just get the best handle on we can. We're, we're gonna be in charge of raising this little baby. <laughs> So, oh, sorry, David, I've got one quick question. Sorry, um, Eva, what's the oh, name? Yeah. Hi. hi, David. Um, what's the um, LinkedIn group that you said? That you Did you say that at the beginning of the session? There's a LinkedIn group. Oh, yeah, thank you. What's so the address? It's, called, it's just called IA, Artificial Intelligence, AI and Evaluation. Uh, and they'll look um, like this uh, really quickly. I'll show you um this yeah, share this with you real quick i'll show you the actual <laughs> one like this and let me just show you what it looks like right over here i think this let's see notifications let me see if that's the one right here let me find the one for you and this is the one of the things on this i got so many files for you here this is the latest one here that we posted on it says ai and evaluation John Beck is helping to uh, coordinate uh, an AI and evaluation over here. And you go like this, if you click on this, then you'll see we have a ton of things uh, going on. We have, uh, he posted a piece on um, ChatGPT evaluation and research that they're charging for, for that session. Uh, and now how to do analysis like I was talking about today. Um, we've got other pieces that people have highlighted that they're working on. Um, we've got, the, oh, this is the session I'll be giving for the American Evaluation Association. Cool picture, huh? Uh, so, and this has articles about everyone's learning together. We're just all posting on this site and just join on in. There's no uh, no real, you know, nothing to do, no payment or nothing. We're just learning together. It came out of our session that we had at AEA. We were so excited and so thrilled about sharing. We thought, let's do it this way and not wait till next year. It's going to be too late. So we're constantly just adding to it. So please, everyone, feel free to join in. You're playing around with it. Show people you're learning. One yeah. last question, um, David. Um, Inge is asking about participatory methods of using AI. Inge, do you wanna do you wanna unmute yourself? Yes, like the last you. question. Yes, thank you. I was just wondering. You know, it's it's amazing to see AI doing all that work, but obviously we're working in a participatory, collaborative, creating ownership approach, and I just wonder how to navigate those two. Yes, I would say there's so much. With, for example, with our work, we've been using the net a lot already, and this is just the next level of using it to help people build their capacity, so they can use it to learn how to do logic models themselves. They can do some of their own data analysis if you show them what to do, and then show them the tools of how to use this uh, and how we use it ourselves. They can see how to use it with their data sets. Uh, there's a ton of things that. It's just perfect for any kind of collaborative participatory empowerment post because you're constantly building their capacity to do this better than us for some parts because they know the area better. And we can be a check and balance and help them make sure it's rigorous on target, check for weaknesses associated with the data sources. We are very valuable at a higher level, but they can do a lot of this themselves once we share that uh, these tools with them, which is why I'm constantly trying to learn so I can help others use this to do their own assessments. And even if you're doing a traditional evaluation, look how much this saves you in terms of data analysis, data collection, um, the, the sorts you can do easily, I mean, without cost, which is amazing. Uh, but the speed is the, the amazing part of it. 
So even if you are doing traditional forms of evaluation, never mind collaborative district empowerment, all of these are powerful at helping us move faster with what we're doing. Quite frankly, like the physicians are learning, probably with more accuracy than we have for a lot of our work. Are we still needed? Absolutely, to put a check on all of this sort of thing, our expert judgment, et cetera. Um, but the head, the, 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 as you hinted, the father or grandfather of artificial intelligence said this, which is not gonna go well and scare a lot of people. He said, the human brain is an amazing machine, phenomenal. But there's no reason to think it's the pinnacle of intelligence. In other words, computers might do some things better than we can. At this point, we're still in the, I know no one wants to hear that, and that we might be out of a job. At this point, physicians are already seeing that this is going to be invaluable to work underneath them, right? That doesn't mean someday it might be that the artificial intelligence is what you check first for polyps, for x-ray issues, and then have the physician judgment to check on that, but then to work at a higher level, then it's able to operate. So instead of being af afraid of it, it's more how can we use this so that we can move and, and maximize our potential rather than being afraid of it taking over. It's just a different frame on that. So I just want to add that. That's coming from the godfather or grandfather of artificial intelligence. I've been trying to learn a lot from people who created this. What they're thinking is above and beyond our specific techniques that we use for evaluation. It's very interesting. So I hope that's a helpful way to end a thoughtful kind of extra extra comment or thought about the larger picture of what this is all about for all of us in our lives. David, there's demand for, for your training. In the quantitative um, area, there's more demand for you to give workshops down here as well. And so we will we will definitely be in touch. Thank you so much, David, for your time. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It's been a wonderful, wonderful educational and informative session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. We thank everyone else. Thank you. I see Judy's over there. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it.